I don't know if any of you have ever had the experience of uh, when somebody talks to you and they just kind of repeat things over and over and over and over time, you, you sort of start to tune them out. I, I got really good at doing that in high school for my mom when she would always be warning me about this thing or that thing or so. Uh, a lot of times I just tune around. My sister would fight with her, but I would just smile and nod and tune her out. And, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm, it's frustrating when, uh, when you're hearing the same message over and over. But it's frustrating on the other end of that, too, isn't it? If you know that if you've ever like, had a teenager that you kept harping about cleaning their room or about not leaving uh, dirty dishes laying around or picking up their dirty clothes after themselves, things like that. I did a funeral one time for a woman who had a couple boys that were notorious for, uh, uh, she said, just taking off their clothes when they got home and just dropping them on the floor here and there. So she told them if they kept doing that, that uh, she was going to take care of them and they weren't going to like it. And so one night, one of the boys came home pretty late and dropped his favorite shirt on the floor. And in the morning, he found out that she'd taken a hammer and nails and nailed it uh, in several places to the floor. And somehow that message still didn't get across. So. What she started doing then was whenever they'd leave their clothes laying around, she'd take a big Ziploc baggie and put the article of clothing in there with water and put it in the freezer. And uh, after doing that a few times when they wanted to wear that shirt or that pair of pants and, and they were in a block of ice, uh, I guess the message finally got across to them. So. Sometimes we're not really good about, um, about listening to messages. Well, sometimes the message that's communicated isn't just trying to get somebody to do something or like advertisers who know that you know, you've got to get a message across at least eight times before people start to hear it. Maybe it's sometimes a warning. Now, how many times do you have to hear a warning before you finally listen to it? Uh, I remember, let me see, how many people are here that are under 38? We got Holly and Lily, Sarah, you're under, uh, you know, we have the, the Jensen kids. Colby, you're under 38, aren't you? No, not anymore? Okay. Well, you were probably pretty little. Addison doesn't remember this at all, but I remember when, when there were all sorts of warnings that came out in the Pacific Northwest about Mount St. Helens. They said, this thing looks like there may be an eruption coming. And they were having headaches with thrill seekers trying to get up there and spend the night in a sleeping bag up on the mountain just to say that, you know, they had done it, and people getting within the danger areas, and co people coming to take pictures and stuff. Well, there was one guy that lived, and he built the Spirit Lake Lodge at the base of Mount St. Helens. His name was Harry R. Truman, no relation to former President Truman. But if you remember, he became kind of a folk hero because he refused to leave despite all of the warnings. He said, that's just absolutely crazy. I've been here for over 50 years, and there have been a couple of earthquakes, but nothing major has ever happened. Besides, I'm three miles away from that volcano. That, it was an active volcano, actually. I'm three miles away from the top of the mountain, and there's all kinds of trees in the way. Nothing is going to get to me. Well, on May 18, 1980, Mount St. Helens erupted. The entire northwest part of the mountain collapsed. 
And you can, you can go online and see video footage of this because there was a, a plane from the Geological Survey that was flying above Mount St. Helens when it erupted and it turned out that what it looks like just a great big side of the mountain started sliding down and created a huge avalanche and then fell in and there was this massive explosion uh, that, that followed that. And um, that blast was estimated at 24 million tons of TNT. It had 500 times the power of the atomic bomb dropped at Hiroshima in World War II. It covered the Spirit Lake Lodge and Harry Truman with 200 feet of rock and dirt. Not just 200 inches, 200 feet of rock and dirt. It leveled trees over 230 square miles. The plume of dust and ash went up over 12 miles into the air. The blast was so powerful that it reduced Mount St. Helens by 1,300 feet and left a crater over a mile wide in some places, nearly two miles wide in other, in other places, and over a half a mile deep, actually 0.67 miles deep in the mountain. Despite all the warnings, the eruption of Mount St. Helens killed Harry Truman and 56 other people who were too close when the mountain erupted. Listening to warnings is important. More recently, now you young, younger folks can get into this one, more recently, if you remember earlier just this month, there was a hurricane, Hurricane Michael, that was projected to hit the Gulf Coast of Florida. And I remember hearing some of the interviews with people on the Gulf Coast who were going to ignore the warnings to evacuate and said they were going to stay there and ride out the hurricane. Uh, one couple in particular said they were going to stay and the husband said, ah, I'm not worried, we've got a refrigerator full of food. And he, he wasn't thinking about what happens when the electricity goes out for days or weeks or, Lord forbid, even months. Um, he did, wasn't thinking about the warnings that there could be up to a 12-foot storm surge, 12 feet of water full of debris swirling and circling like a washing machine agitator. He wasn't concerned about the wind, even though by the time Michael came ashore, uh, the, the sustained winds were 155 miles an hour, with gusts up to 175 miles an hour, and being in a place where tornadoes hit. We know what that kind of wind can do, and we know the result from these pictures. I mean, it really does. Look at the bottom. It looks like a tornado hit there. But those were straight for, for the hurricane winds. And I was talking to Ron Linda Trepto this morning, and they said that where that hurricane hit is really the poorest part of Florida. And he said the folks down there, he said they really felt sorry for them. He said they don't have anything hardly. And so that's not after the hurricane. That was even before the hurricane. And so those folks are uh, in some pretty dire straits in the midst of all of the, the mess and the destruction. Um, as of last week, the death toll, death toll from Michael stood at 35 people. Well, Jesus gave warnings over and over and over again to watch and to be ready for his return, right? You might say that uh, people may have poo-pooed that and said, oh, 
you know, it's just not going to happen. He hasn't come back since he left. So we don't feel like we need to pay attention to those warnings. But those warnings of Jesus have been preserved in the Gospels and also in the book of Revelation. There's not one of us here that can claim ignorance about those warnings from Jesus. And you might say that today's parable is a follow-up on last week's to watch and, and be waiting and ready. <clears throat> but this morning's parable goes a little bit deeper into the consequences for the wise servants on one hand and the foolish servants who disobey the Lord's words on the other hand. Jesus said of those servants who are assigned to care for others and give them their food at the proper time, that it will be good for the, the servant whose master finds him doing that when he returns. Jesus said, I tell you the truth, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. That sounds like a lot of responsibilities, but wow, doesn't it boggle the mind when you consider that God owns everything? I mean, he's the Lord of heaven and earth. And not just earth. We don't know what the scope of that promise is. But like I said, it just boggles the mind to think about it. That we may be put in charge of massive extents of God's creation. If we are faithful to what Jesus said and are found doing it when he returns. However, for those foolish servants that don't care for others, but as Jesus said, those who beat their fellow servants and eat and drink with the drunkards, the prospects aren't nearly as pleasant, are they? Jesus said those unfaithful servants, the master would, cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's the way that Jesus talked about the outer darkness or hell for those who are, are punished when the Lord returns. Sounds pretty, uh, pretty stark, pretty chilling. Well, there are at least three observations that I'd like to make about this parable, uh, and I'm going to share those with you now, whether you like it or not. So, the first observation is that in this parable, there is no forgiveness, no recourse, or no appeal for disobedience once the Master returns. When Jesus comes back, say, oh, wait, 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 get I need a do-over. How about a mulligan so I can do your will now that I know you're coming back? That would be like Harry Truman saying to the mountain, oh, wait a minute, can you uninterrupt and go back to the way things were before the mountain blew up so that I can go ahead and evacuate and, and do what I was warned to do? Or people on the Gulf Coast saying, oh, wait, come on, Hurricane Michael, come on back and put everything back the way it was so that I can get out of here before the hurricane hits. I mean, that's silly. Nobody would think about that. In the same way, in this parable, it's pretty clear that once Jesus returns, that's it. I mean, it's everybody out of the pool at that point. And the way we're found is the way that it will be. It's a grim reality for those who are not willing to be obedient to God. The second observation we could make is that those servants who are rewarded and those who are punished in this parable are all servants. In other words, they're all part of the household of the master, part of the household of God. That means that if you sort of make a parallel from that parable to this church, that 
it's not about those in the church versus those outside. There's no mention of those outside the church in this parable at all. It's those in the church, whether they are being obedient or whether they're being disobedient. And that's what is the dividing line. That is what makes the difference in whether there is reward or punishment. Because you remember, Jesus said in another place, many will say to me on that day, in other words, judgment day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. I know Eddie, though. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Matthew 7, 22 and 23, part of the Sermon on the Mount. The third observation is that this parable is about servants who have been put in charge of those in the household. That means it's primarily about those in leadership. We got a monkey. Okay, so this parable is mainly about those in leadership. It doesn't matter whether that leadership is as a bishop or as a pastor, as a Sunday school teacher, or an administrative council member. Jesus calls us to care for the people of the household of God. It calls us to be responsible rather than irresponsible leaders. Well, some of you might hear that last point and say, Oh, good! I'm not a leader. That means I'm off the hook. This doesn't apply to me. It's only for the preacher and, and the people in the conference, right? Well, no, it isn't. Because Jesus said that... Okay, last week in Mark's Gospel, Jesus said, What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. <coughs> we, okay, hey, I'll watch. Here, can you give me your hand? There we go. Good job. Okay. Yeah, we don't want to be flying there. <laughs> Okay, Jesus, in fact, has called all of us to serve one another. So if we are loving people, if we are loving our neighbors, if we're loving one another as he instructed us, then we should be okay. But if we're not, that's a question. How many times... Do we need to hear Jesus' warning before we start caring for the least and the last and the lost as Jesus did? Thanks be to God for warnings that are heard and heeded. Amen and amen.